AWS Loft Talks. My name is Kilton, and uh, I'm co-founder of a new company called IOTracks that I can't tell you too much about at the moment, but I have been for the last year or so helping both municipalities and startups um, get a proper scope of uh, IoT. What I aim to do is to give you a very brief, high-level tour of the Internet of Things from an engineer's perspective. Uh, to be successful here, I want you to come away saying, wow, there's a lot to look at that's in different spaces than I thought. So if that's what happens, good. All right, so this is the big picture. IoT is really about M to M, which is machine to machine, meeting the internet. M to M's been going on for a long, long time, and there's a lot of established practices there and a lot of success. But now along comes the greater connectivity and a whole different development paradigm, and the two are colliding. And so this is what the new landscape is going to shake out to be. It will be something like this. So what you have, you have all the devices, which is this is what everyone's talking about, and they're out there at this place called the edge. And uh, the edge now becomes actually really, really important. Up until now, the edge has been where you put a gateway router in order to get to the internet and then forget that the edge exists, and that's not the case any longer. And then you have this new thing called the cloud edge. And the cloud edge uh, is an opportunity to take um, devices that are near where processing is happening, but they're publicly on the public internet and do things, um, little bits of magic that I'm going to uh, get into that would make the greater cloud more functional. And then you have old cloud, new cloud. The only reason I called it that is that old cloud means that's where you're actually keeping all of the stuff that runs your businesses and so on. New cloud is the stuff that's being added in order to make the IoT functionality work. The two do need to come together, so I just put that little divider. They're pretty much the same cloud, but you know, new versus old. So, this is what's happening right now. This is the state of IoT. We're doing this much of what's possible. We're taking stuff that, uh, we're taking the new devices and we're putting it up to new cloud. So a really good example would be um, a uh, sensor that you buy that uh, sits in your home and maybe it checks the temperature and then it puts that temperature up to its cloud and then you use a mobile app which reads from that cloud to find out what your temperature is in your home while you're away from the house. That's exactly this type of scenario. Just, uh, just the bare beginnings of what we can do. And uh, now this is something that's going to happen in the near future. When you think about peer-to-peer -peer in the regular um, uh, computing world that we've known for, for decades now, you think about a computer connecting to the internet and then it says, I'm gonna scan using the software for someone to share music with or you know, transfer some files and that's peer-to-peer -peer or video conferencing, right? And when paired up, it sends packets directly over to this other IP address. Well, devices doing peer-to-peer -peer is not at all the same. You don't have public IP addresses, and they need facilitation in order to do the hops between each other. So now the edge becomes mission critical. So you won't have equipment on the edge that goes into the cloud. You'll have equipment on the edge that lets you circumvent the cloud in order to do high-performance stuff. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't require high-performance. That's fine. But just imagine you need that door to open right when you're approaching it because you're coming through with a hospital patient on a gurney. This is not acceptable to say, uh, it's low connectivity. Oh, there we go, now let's walk through, right? You're on your way to the emergency room. It needs to open as you pass. And then this is the type of connectivity that we can expect toward the, the completion of the, uh, you know, the filling out of the Internet of Things. You have here the same old connectivity, right? New stuff talking to new cloud directly, that's fine. For Internet protocol enabled stuff, that's great. You have new cloud, old cloud playing friendly, that's obvious. Cloud Edge coming in, that's obvious too. That's got to happen. That's all cloud after all. But then you have circumventing the cloud on the edge. You have the edge reaching another edge through the cloud edge and so on. A whole lot of mixed connections here. It's kind of like a, a, a net, a net of nets. So let's look at devices. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the pieces that are, um, that are areas you may not know and I'm gonna skip the basic cloud stuff. That's stuff that you guys probably have a really good handle on, and obviously, um, you know, AWS gives you a really good handle on a lot of options you have in the cloud. So let's look down at devices. So here's what matters for devices. Networks and connectivity, and that's networks with an S, because um, the regular internet stuff is not all that relevant when you get down to lightweight devices. Um, protocols, you've probably heard of like MQTT and then, you know, or maybe the thread protocol or, yeah, that stuff's relevant there. 
run times. If you have a device that's just sensing and broadcasting, that's fine. But wouldn't it be better if it sensed, judged that it was meaningful, and broadcast that so that you only needed to listen when there was something worth listening to? So run times out at dev the device level are really helpful. Um, cost is super important. Um, the power and complexity, I'm going to actually walk through these, so I won't spend but, uh, you know, any longer on that at the moment. Security, it starts at the device level, so security can't be added later. If a device is compromised, then the rest of the chain is compromised. Upgrades and maintenance are important, and bi-directional communication with low latency. It's just like what I was talking about with the door opening, but the information flows in two directions now. Unlike, unlike on the traditional internet, right, which is pushing content out. So here's some example networks. How many in the audience have heard of ultra-narrowband? as a network. There's a couple. I see. All right, great. That's good. I'm glad that some have. So what this is, is this is, um, it's not Wi-Fi, it's not cellular, it's somewhere in between. You can go several miles, but you can only send like 20 bytes. But your battery might last four years. That's pretty cool stuff. So all of these network options are all relevant for devices. And that means that, you know, in each use case, you're going to have a different choice of networks that's appropriate. And over those networks, here's a bunch of protocols. This is not all of them. This is a partially complete list. But um, I'm often hearing people say that a standard protocol will emerge or that there will be one protocol that will dominate. This is not going to happen. I'm seeing the, the, the head shaking no because from, from those who are wise and have seen this before, what's actually going to happen is that protocols will be really good at certain use cases and they will be used there. So maybe some industries will start to standardize, but for the most part, this isn't going away. And if you look back at M2M, &M, there's not room on the screen to show all of the different uh, device languages and protocols that can be used to interchange information from the M2M &M era. And that's been going on so long, and it's just gotten more complex. It seems unlikely that anyone's going to settle on uh, a small set of protocols. So I would say in devices, there's three types. The lightweight type probably doesn't have TCP IP. It just doesn't make sense. And we're talking very cheap here. Wireless radios that are $1, $2 devices to put on there, and you don't pay a monthly subscription fee for them, that wouldn't make sense for thousands of devices. Or they may even have a wired connection, but little data, probably no runtime, use them for one thing, and that's it. But then you get these medium devices. They might have a small runtime. Um, you can push some code out, and um, you know maybe it gets compiled there because it's a small runtime, but some cool stuff. And it might have HTTP, actually. And it probably has TCP IP. And then you have these heavy devices. And for the most part, this is what you can probably build yourself with prototyping boards because it's meant to have a real runtime and so on. Just know where they're supposed to be used. You can migrate from this to this once you know what it's, what it's good for. But beware, you might not be able to use HTTP in that case. So in the device world, what we already know embedded and you know old wireless RF technologies, um, small data packets, system on chip. We know how to do that. And that would be the people that have been doing embedded for a long time. What's new? New connectivity options. APIs where you don't know ahead of time who's going to use your data. So how do you expose it in a way that allows them to make use of it? Um, web developers are new in the device space, right? So this is just this is that collision of M to M and internet. So now let's talk about the edge and what's happening there. So still important networks and protocols, but only where they face the devices, because on the edge, you transfer from specialty networks and protocols into regular internet connectivity. That's the purpose of the edge, to be a demarcation point. Runtimes are super important on the edge, because that's where you actually get to implement things like rules and filtering and so on. Security is still important. Privacy becomes important because a temperature sensor Nobody's going to really learn much about my life with a temperature sensor, but on the edge, that's where temperature meets what time I'm home, meets how many keys there are accessing the house, et cetera, and now it becomes a picture of who I am. So that's where privacy comes in. Still bi-directional communication and integration happens on the edge. Context gets added on the edge as well. Um, a temperature reading has very little value if you just have a number. But on the edge, you can say this is a temperature reading from this time of day from this location. It's in uh, Celsius, right? And here's the, the number of precision points that should be included in this figure, right, as it gets transmitted because if binary doesn't actually have decimal points in it, right? And now we have uh, context. Uh, say a little bit more about that. In the internet world, uh, regular web development, context comes from the application someone's using or the page they're requesting. 
Uh, if you're running a website that gives out the weather and somebody asks for a page to give you know, the, uh, the weather for the certain zip code, you don't need too much more context around that. Maybe you get some info about whether they're, you know, what browser they're on and so on. In the mobile world, we started getting context about where they were, right? And then, you know, of course, there's privacy issues with that, but there's some built-in context. And now in the new era, we actually have context that's not coming from something that's personal, but context that may be the aggregation of a lot of different factors that you can't predict. So you can say on your phone, don't share my location. But how do you walk around your house to every little device there when you download a new app, right, which doesn't even, how do you do that, right? There's where do you download it to, right, to some gateway? It doesn't have an interface. But let's just say that you're running an IoT app. You're not going to walk around your house and look at little screens on the blinds and then in the, on the refrigerator. There's not screens on anything. But together, they make a context that might actually be really helpful to you. It could be really harmful to you. So the edge is the place where all of that can get handled. So imagine that you know that this is happening and you have the proper equipment on the edge to say, hey, we're about to bring this all together and this is like kind of what it looks like on the output. Do you want to share that? Oh, no, it includes this, right? I don't want to share that. So that's the important context. Uh, old stuff, we all know local area networks. The M2M, uh, you know, people have been doing this for dozens of years. They're really good at it and we know real-time processing. But now do we know real-time analytics that comes from data from lots of different sources? Not so much internet connection focus, web developers again, and different edges being wired together is pretty new. It's not typically done. Um, you're not gonna connect to machine shops that are 20 miles away, um, you know, right today. I don't see a lot of value in that, but you might connect two different building campuses owned by the same company now. And then lastly, let's talk about cloud edge and what this even is. So what's important on the cloud edge? Speed, filtering rules and aggregation, and uh, what you want here is you want only valuable data to make it up to the main cloud. High availability, of course. And now, for the first time, the cloud is going to be pushing out commands. Because up until now, you haven't had the cloud as a source of, of action. You've had the cloud as a source of information to be consumed by devices. Then they take the action. But now you will have commands coming out of the cloud that need to get there in time. And then taking in large data volume. So. On the cloud, this is your last chance to filter out noise before it affects the back-end system, which is what you're trying to prevent three terabytes a day you know, of information from the IoT world coming up into. That's, that's what's scary for everybody, right? So many devices, so much data. Um, but it's also the first chance for you to perform aggregation. And so that's why the cloud edge exists on my diagram. You want to take in, before going into a system that's maybe going to choke on it, take in a lot of information, make value out of it, and protect against the things that could be harmful and add some value. Uh, you can also do the same thing to protect uh, while you go from one edge to another. So what's, uh, what's old there? Content delivery. So there's a lot of companies that do that are content delivery networks, and they take stuff and they push it out to the, what, you know, it was called the edge until now, but it's really the cloud edge. Um, and uh, what's typical there is uh, all TCP, IP, and HTTP. We're leaving the load on the main cloud. Um, and it's typical to use it for multiple things. But what's new is information coming in in large volume. Sustained connections are going to be really challenging. So it's not typical to have a web application that sits with connections open to a whole lot of different devices. Those situations may be able, may begin to arise, or at least a whole bunch of connections to edge devices. And it's no longer going to be transparent. Content delivery networks, really transparent. You get some images because you're on a shopping website, right? And then they all come up really fast. And you say, wow, this, this site's really performant, right? Turns out it's just down the street that it's serving it from, which is the cloud edge. But now, all of a sudden, you're going to be aware of what happens on the cloud edge because this is where a lot of value is going to get added. So the new end state with IoT is um, performance used to be measured in page response time. That's going to be a far less relevant metric. Now variability is going to be a really important metric. So, you know, speed is good, but if it goes from one second to ten seconds and the variability is, you know, is really high there, um, it's hard to say that you actually have a, a very performant system. Uh, and uh, the real world action we're looking for requires low latency. The data from the devices is going to be smaller than ever, which seems almost meaningless per device, but the data reaching the final back end, if this is done right, is going to be bigger than ever before. That's an interesting contradiction there. Information flows in two directions, as I had mentioned, and 
typically applications now on the web are designed, they wait for a page request and then they operate on that. That's no longer going to be the case. There's going to be processes running constantly waiting for new information over the same pipes that have been open for 24 hours. Um, and now it's commands. So think about what if your web application serves out incorrect information? So that's pretty bad. And if you get a bad reputation, that's really bad, you know, if you do it for too long. But what if it serves out a bad command that actually unlocks a door and gives public access to a protected warehouse? This is very bad. And you have to think about what it is that you're building now and how it can impact the real world. And lastly, identity and authentication, it's not going to be usernames and passwords. You're going to have things like Bluetooth low energy key fobs that interact with a system in a building that pass that authentication token in and you don't have anyone's login and you're not going to get their email for your application because all it is is public access to a building when they picked up the little badge because they showed their ID or whatever. So very different paradigm. Uh, REST APIs are awesome. It's all right. It's all, right. It's all good. But they only cover a part of what needs to be done. And uh, now big data is going to happen in full force, and that's real-time big data, right? Streams coming in that can be read in real-time and acted on real-time. So I think that about wraps it up. AWS Loft Talks.